You know, it's so good to be able to go to a market like Statesboro because there's actually something good going on here. It is not fun to go to a market where there's not something good happening. So good stories here. But I want to spend a little bit of time um, talking about Fed actions, and they've obviously probably going to change a little bit given what's going on in the past few days. I want to talk about how their actions are affecting the economy and what we see going down the road. I want to show you some evidence of how their actions are manifesting themselves in the economy. And then I'm going to switch over to commercial real estate, which is my bread and butter. I'm an appraiser by trade. And covering that is really integral and in giving a good picture on the overall economy. And it's particularly relevant to Statesboro because you guys are about to have some significant boosts in several of those categories. I'm looking forward to discussing that. So with that, let's look at um, Fed funds rates. So what a difference a year makes. If I go back a year and I think about the projections that Synovus and what other banks were thinking we would see on the federal funds rate, we thought there'd be four 25 basis point rate hikes. Think about that for a second. That is crazy. We um, actually went up 450, and you know that of course led to a lot of the issues that we've seen over the past few days. Now, Fed estimates, they'll tell you that they think they're going to peak out at about 5.1%. Consensus is, is that it would probably be a little bit higher than that, but we may see a little bit of pullback seeing them what you've done over the past few days. Now, this is the Fed's chart about where they think they're going to be. Let me ask you a question. Who is the absolute worst at predicting what the Fed's going to do? The Fed. So take this with a grain of salt, but I really don't think it's that inaccurate. What it's saying is by 25, we're probably at rates that are around 3%. I think that's probably fair, but we'll see how the war on inflation goes. Now, what can the Fed do? What they do is they can attack demand. They can't do anything with supply. And they do that by devaluing assets, and we'll talk about how that happens. They do that by promoting lower investment. It sounds kind of contrary, but that's what they do. And essentially, they're going to create some employment losses to slow down the economy a little bit. And when you think about what the Fed can and can't do, let me show you an example of that. Anybody know who Peppa Pig is? Okay. See, we got a few in the room that do. So this is my daughter, Rally. She's two years old. She loves Peppa Pig. And my analyst, Brooke Blackwell, and I were sitting around trying to think about, you know, all the ways that we saw holes in how the Fed would approach this attack on inflation. And it occurred to me, this was right before Christmas. You know, we're just kind of nerds. We're still in there on December 23rd, crunching numbers and having these discussions. And I had to go to Target to pick up this Peppa Pig playset that my daughter had. And it occurred to me, Peppa Pig is probably a good way to explain the holes and, and the hurdles that the Fed uh, uh, faces. So let me start um, with part one over in China, because Peppa, depending on which size you buy, she's about two to three inches tall and she's plastic and she's made in China. And she's most likely made in Shanghai or Shenzhen, China. Everybody know what Shanghai is? I think there's got some nods. How about Shenzhen? Not quite as much recognition about Shenzhen, but you guys are near a port, so there may be some more here. Problem is, is that when you look at where Peppa's created in those markets, you've had a lot of shutdown in those Chinese factories, and you've had a lot of shutdowns of the ports. And it isn't like these COVID-19 shutdowns that we had in the Southeast, where you can basically do what you want to, just wear a mask. They actually have magnetic door locks that trigger an alarm at Communist Party Central when you go out. This is a real deal. They shut down these markets. And you may think, okay, Shanghai, Shenzhen, what does that really mean? Well, let me give you an example of the size. Shanghai has 22 million people that live there. Shenzhen has 18, 40 million total. That's more than New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago combined. So think about that. If we shut down those markets, how do you think our economy would do? Well, it's not really dissimilar in China in terms of overall impact. So if I'm looking at PEPA and I'm thinking about how PEPA, and, uh, how PEPA affects inflation, if I can't produce it and I can't get it out of the country, that limits supply and that boosts the price up. So that's inflationary. 
And let me ask you the first question here. Can the Fed do anything to open Chinese ports or manufacturing plants? Nope, they can't. So we'll move to number two. Let's say that PEPA gets produced and it's going to be shipped over here to the United States and we're gonna to go to the West Coast on this end. And one of the things that we see is that oil prices have been particularly high. Now they were very high when Ukraine was first invaded. It's amazing that that was just a year ago, but it was. And that boosted up oil prices and they've come back down a little bit, but diesel prices hadn't. But once again, this is inflationary, it adds cost to PEPA getting over here to the United States. And I'll ask you this, can the Fed do anything about making Putin get out of the Ukraine? Nope, they can't, not a thing. Now let's say that PEPA actually manages to get all the way over to Los Angeles and it gets near a port. Let me see a show of hands, who water skis here? Got a few, there's always, I know it's early, so I, I know how that is. But if you water ski, you know that when you're coming back in the dock, there's a thing called a no wake zone where you slow down your boat and you kind of glide into the dock. Well, that's exactly what you have to do in the port at LA. You just shut off the engines, you uh, coast on in there and you pay a ton of environmental fees to do that. And that is inflationary. There's nothing that the Fed can do to lower those rates. If you get into the port, this big boat full of plastic pepper dolls, it has to be unloaded by longshoremen. Now you guys are near Savannah, so you're more familiar with that than most groups that I speak to. But if you're familiar with the longshoremen strikes in California, they've been going on for years and they're still not resolved. There's nobody to take Peppa off the boat. You've got to resolve those issues. And can the Fed fix that? No, they can't. Continues to add to the inflationary aspect of it. Now let's say that there are some longshoremen and they manage to offload Peppa get it off the boat, and they're gonna put it on a truck to send it over to me in Georgia. Well, guess what? There are no truck drivers. If you look at turnover in the truck driving industry last year, of the 10 people that an average firm would hire, nine of them quit and left and went somewhere else. 90% turnover. That's insane and it's unsustainable. And if you found a truck driver, you'd have to put them in a truck. And guess what? If we can't produce cars, we can't produce trucks. They both require chips. We just don't think about it. Now I've got a little purple, you can't really see this very well, but I have a little purple number on the seven next to the chip. And this is where it's interesting because let's take Hyundai, obviously important here. If you think about cars that have been on the road that you've seen post COVID, seen a bunch of Hyundais, seen a bunch of Kias. Korean cars, think about it. You hadn't seen a lot of other new ones, you know, Ford Broncos didn't really roll off the lines, but a ton of Korean cars. Why is that? Because the government in Korea subsidizes their chip industry. So that's a good sign. Those Korean manufacturers are in a lot better position than other car manufacturers around the world and they haven't been affected as much by supply and demand. But that's another piece. Supply chains boost up the price of goods and of course, if you can't find trucking, then you're gonna put it on the railroads and that boosts prices up. You all know back in December, the government had to intervene to get the railroads moving again. And um, the Fed couldn't do one thing about that. So throughout this whole journey, which adds cost to every single piece of the line on this Pepidol that I'm gonna buy, the Fed can do absolutely nothing. Now, what can the Fed do? They could make me a sad dad. And let me tell you how I became a sad dad. I, my daughter's lovely and my wife is pregnant. She's thrilled that I'm on the road as much as I am. But um, we had to buy a bigger house. And unfortunately, we had to buy it in September. And I felt like I had been taken out behind the barn and whipped with that mortgage rate. Don't think we get a great break at Sonovas as an employee, sorry to say. But the bottom line is now I feel like I'm made out like a bandit but it certainly wasn't as good as my high 2% rate. And because the Fed can affect interest rates and they particularly can affect the housing sector, they're gonna make me think, wow, my mortgage went up 30%. I don't know if I wanna buy Pebble. And that's the kind of demand destruction that we see. So I know the next time your kid or grandchild flips on Peppa Pig, this is just gonna tr uh, trigger a thought wave and you can just blame me about that. So. What can the Fed do about this? Get that thing going. There we go. 
They raise rates and they also lower sentiment, and those are uh, interrelated. And when we look at mortgage rates, there we go, um, leading to the situation that I found myself in in September is far worse. We see mortgage rates right around 7% right now. And I'm going to talk a little bit about affordability in just a second, but that's certainly concerning, and that puts a huge dent in any demand for housing and pushes affordability through the roof. And it doesn't just affect uh, residential housing, it also affects commercial real estate. Now this is a chart from uh, the Federal Reserve Senior Loan Officer Survey. And what they're showing here is demand for commercial real estate. Uh, uh, this one is actually showing standards for commercial real estate loans. So is the bank tightening up the underwriting when commercial real estate deals come to the table? And 70% of respondents said they are. So this is reducing the supply of capital that's available for investment in the country. But it's not just the banks who are tightening down. If you look at demand for commercial real estate, so this is what are the investors thinking, they've actually pulled back and about 70% of them are saying we're less interested in doing a commercial real estate deal. So these are two sources of pullback in the economy that uh, shows that there's going to be a little bit of slowdown in production and essentially GDP. And we see it in the industry numbers. And I'll show you a few places uh, in particular. One thing that we do is we track industry cash inflows. So we will look at um, commercial operations and we will look at the, at the revenues that are coming into their accounts and also the expenses that they're paying. And we can use that as a proxy for the health of their industry. And what this is showing over here on the right hand side Got a little red dotted line below, that's 0%. Anything above that is positive cash inflow. So this is the construction industry. Go back to May 21, here's January 22, January 23. What you can see is that we pressed it up and now we're coming back down. That mirrors exactly what we saw on that chart for demand for commercial real estate. And you see it permeate other sectors of real estate, and I'll show you what's going on with real estate agents and brokers. Once again, that red dotted line is 0%. The revenues that have come into these industries have dropped significantly, about 20 to 30%. So this tells me that there's going to be less demand by people that work in these industries when it comes to consumption, because obviously houses aren't trading, and that is pulling down revenues for agents and brokers. And then speaking to my own trade, let's look at appraisers. They're having an even worse time. They're down about 40 to 50%. Why? Well, this is self-evident. There's nothing to appraise. So revenues aren't coming in. And I think that when you look at an environment like our country that relies so much on residential real estate, these are issues that are affecting the people that work in these industries it will lower employment and it will lower aggregate demand. Now, it isn't just uh, commercial real estate, we also see these same factors in commercial and industrial lending. So once again, right here, banks are raising standards at the same time that investors are pulling back from new deals because the cost of borrowing is prohibitive and because the economy has a lot of turbulence in it. So that's what the Fed can do with rates to uh, wreak a little habit and um, pull down asset values and erode demand. Now, the other thing they can do is they can greatly affect sentiment through this. And if you look at this chart, these are various economic elements that we track. Up at the top, you've got some housing market indices going back 18 months. These indices are down about 40 to 50 percent. You look at consumer sentiment, it's down significantly. Commercial uh, sentiment is down significantly. Um, what's interesting, actually, is when I look at manufacturing, that's just a little bit, um, that's actually uh, right around the lines. It's been negative, but in Statesboro, that won't be the case. So you guys are going to buck the trend a little bit with what's coming. In most of the country, we see manufacturing going down and services consumption going way up. Also, when you look at commodities, and this is down at the bottom, we see very large drops in commodity prices, and this is actually good. This is showing some disinflationary pressure, and it does mean that things will come down in terms of cost to produce projects, 
And I'll point out steel and wood are two that have dropped significantly. And why is that? Because we know that there'll be less commercial real estate projects being done. You need less wood and steel. It just all makes sense. So, but I'll point out the green things. The Fed's big hurdle here is this labor situation. We still have an amazingly low unemployment rate, especially here in Georgia. And they're having trouble fighting these inflationary trends when you've got labor strength like we have. And job openings, they're really not going down much at all. We still have 10 million open jobs. So you tell me if we've got to see unemployment rise and there are 10 million open jobs, that's a tall task. And that's really what the Fed's up against. Now, another aspect of the consumer sentiment piece is how much do consumers think they're going to spend going forward. And this is a survey that Deloitte put out in January. And what it's saying over here on the left is that spending intentions have gone into the negative territory. So consumers don't think they're going to spend as much. And that's really important. We're going to get into that in just a second. But more importantly, over here on the right, the personal savings rate is right around 2%. Now, it was about 7 or 8% back when we had so much money in the system we didn't know what to do with. But what this is saying is that it costs more to live, and wages aren't quite going up as much to cover it, so people can't save as much as they did, and they're dipping into their savings. And we're seeing this with credit card balances, and we see it in the savings rate. So a little bit of tightness on that. Now this leads to economic figures that you would think, okay, we'd see a little bit of depression there. And I'll tell you, I um, hate to get into some math, I've got two math pieces here and I've got a little thing to spice it up that'll, that'll wake us up a little bit before we do it. But I wanted to talk about GDP because most people, you know, you hear about it, they put a lot of stake in the numbers, but they really don't know what the elements are. And let me point them out, number one, is C, that's consumer spending. That's 70% of GDP. It is the most important factor by far. So the US GDP strength relies on what the consumer's doing. And if consumer sentiment has been negative, that does not exactly give you a positive outlook on it. I is investment. So that's whether you buy a house or whether a company builds a new building or they invest in a new software package, those kinds of things fall under investment. Then there's government spending. That's kind of a wild card. The government can ratchet that up. You know, that can boost up GDP. And lastly, uh, there's the uh, trade balance or net exports, so exports minus imports. And what's interesting here is that imports are a negative in GDP. So if we're importing less, that actually adds to GDP. And that seems kind of counterintuitive because if I want to buy a bunch of Japanese audiovisual products, what this would tell me is that if I import less of those, that actually boosts GDP. So it looks like consumption, but it's not. It's actually less on the import side. And that's important because when you drill down into the GDP numbers that we've seen over the past two quarters, let's start with the third quarter. I was driving down the road, had Bloomberg on, and I heard third quarter GDP 3.2%. I almost ran off the road. I was like, wait a minute, how is that going on? We're supposed to be in a recession. Well, it's my job to break this stuff down. And what's interesting is that when you drill into these sectors, what you see is, first off, the goods number was negative. So once again, if consumption is 70% of GDP and goods is down, that's a negative component right there. We need to watch that. Now, services was way up. That was a positive. We know that services are doing well. But look where they are. It's in healthcare. Healthcare comprised the greatest percentage of that services increase, and that's inflation. I mean, think about your copays and what you're paying at the doctor over the past three years. It's gone up significantly. It's cutting into your spend, and it's showing up as positive GDP. That's not the fun kind of money that you spend. It's like buying a, a roof or tires. No offense to tire dealers and roof people in there, <laughs> but nobody wants to buy those. It's similar to medical services. And what we've seen is recreation and food services, which has been such a large component of the GDP just after COVID, so the past 18 months, is actually coming down as a percentage, and that's concerning. When you look at fixed investment, that's negative, um, most of it being in uh, structures. Once again, we talked about 
uh, fewer homes being built and fewer commercial real estate projects being built. So that, of course, shows up as a negative. But then we get to the net uh, exports thing. And what we see is that exports was a large number. That was because supply chains thawed up and we were able to move a lot of product out of the country. But at the same time, we didn't import a lot of stuff. We imported less. And that shows up as a positive number. And the government spend down at the bottom was a big chunk of spending too. That's a wild card. If you take out that net exports piece and you take out the government piece, you actually have a GDP that's negative. So think about that. Those are factors that are kind of hard to pin down and it's not real true consumption. So we watch out for this. When you see 3.2%, you gotta think, wait a minute, we're here and we're in a recession. We're really right at about zero growth on the third quarter. So fourth quarter came in at 2.9, and I think this shocked me just as much as the third quarter did. And when you break this down, we actually had, uh, let me get to that one. We actually had a goods number that was positive. Well, that goods number was primarily comprised of automobile sales. Why? Because automobiles have started to come back to the dealerships, the numbers are back up and you're seeing a lot of spend. Now, think about how much an automobile is now. It's extremely expensive, unbelievable uh, spend there. But that was the major component of it. You didn't see a lot of other goods on it. When you break down services that was positive, you had once again, healthcare was the largest component, but housing was a major component of it. And that's rent inflation and also the spend on mortgages as mortgage rates go up. So these are elements that really don't represent the fun, awesome consumption that we had just prior to COVID, where we were buying boats and decks to put on the back of the houses and we were going on vacation left and right. This is my rent's more expensive. My doctor's more expensive. It shows up as positive GDP, but it's just not fun money. That's all there is to it. So. This actually was on Bloomberg this morning and it shows this is um, uh, looking at core inflation from yesterday. If you look at the components, services, goods, food and energy services is way up. It's the largest component. Goods has come down. So goods are disinflationary. That's been good. Food's kind of held in and oil prices and energy have come down. But those services have stayed high. And once again, we talked about housing. If you look at how much housing inflation has gone up, it continues to shoot right up through the roof. So once again, these housing prices and some of these inflationary service issues are what's dominating GDP right now, and it's making it a tough story. Now, I know that was a lot of negative, no fun news, but the good news is you guys are gonna buck that trend, and I'm gonna get into that in just a bit. All right, so we're gonna switch over to commercial real estate because this is a great way to highlight a lot of the ways that Statesboro has some advantages over a lot of our markets. And I want to start off with capital markets highlights where we look at the five major sectors of commercial real estate and we see how they're trading. And when we look at year over year and over the past fourth quarter, every single segment is negative. So less commercial real estate is trading. I don't think that's really surprising with interest rates where they are, with concerns about the economy, you have people that are less willing to invest but you've seen these numbers pull back fairly dramatically. Um, here's my math piece that I'm gonna give you, and I'm gonna apologize for this. How many people in the room are actively involved in commercial real estate or own a building? Okay, got a few good hands. So you guys may wanna lean in. The rest of you who don't do commercial real estate all the time, just bear with this. This is pretty simple. As an appraiser, the value equation for commercial real estate is net operating income, so what you're bringing in minus your expenses, divided by what we call the cap rate. And a cap rate is a function of risk, as are interest rates. So what matters here, we can all divide, is that if interest rates go up, cap rates go up. And all things being equal, that brings commercial real estate values down. So just keep that in mind and we'll move on to the next one. Promise this is the last bit of math. If we look over here on the left-hand side, these are our commercial real estate sectors and you've got the year-over-year -year price change over on the left. And what we saw between 21 and 22 were huge spikes in commercial real estate values on the order of 20 to 30%, astronomical. Just tons of post-COVID money that flooded into the sector. But as we got into 22, 
you saw this start to turn over, and it was two particular places where it happened. Now that IP1, we call it inflection point one, that was March of last year. So what happened in March of last year? We've already referenced it. Ukraine was invaded. We figured out that this was not going to be a weekend war and it was going to drag on a long time. And as soon as that happened, you had people think, wait a minute, we're going to have an economy that's a little bit rougher than what we thought, so I'm going to pull back from commercial real estate investment. And you saw that, that curve start to turn over. Then you had inflection point two. That came about in mid-May. And what happened in mid-May? That's when we all realized, wait a minute, this isn't going to be four or five 25 basis point rate hikes. This is going to be four or five 75 basis point rate hikes. And that freaked everybody out because they saw that as a challenge to real estate values because, like I said, cap rates are a function of risk. As our interest rates and as interest rates go up, commercial real estate values should come down. So that made people concerned. Over on the right-hand side, you've got a cap rate chart. And on the same inflection points, cap rates didn't move much after Ukraine, but as soon as those rates started to go up, then you saw the cap rates start to push up a little bit and drive values uh, down just a little bit. And I'll show you why this has to happen. So up on the right, up top hand side, this is a multifamily cap rate. And on the bottom, we've got the 10 year yield. So go back to finance 101, you know what a risk premium is, you've got the risk-free rate, which is the 10-year, and as an investor, you're going to want something for the investment that you put in a, uh, in a development, and that's the risk premium spread. Going back to 2005, prior to the great financial crisis, we were at 260 basis points. That was kind of a dangerously tight spread, but after GFC, when the real estate markets collapsed, we went out to about 500 basis points, and that spread has contracted all through the years but over the past 18 months, what we've seen is that number shrunk to about 140 basis points. So if we were concerned about that 260 back in 2005, this makes everybody super nervous. And what that guarantees is that the cap rates will go up and commercial real estate values will come down. Because think about it, you can think about this gap, you want to make it real simple, is almost like the profit and you're going to demand some profit if you're in that gap and you're a real estate investor, you're going to think, wait a minute, I want more than that, and that's going to push cap rates up, which will push down values. Now, here we go. So what have cap rates done? Well, I want to point out two in particular, multifamily and warehouse, because those are the two hottest sectors um, in the markets right now, and you, of course, have a bunch of warehouse around here you're about to have more and savannah's got a big influence but warehouse numbers what i want to point out is we're around four percent there and apartment numbers we're at about four percent there everywhere else the cap rates are a little bit higher and we saw increases in cap rates in the market now why does this matter because sorry i'm losing my spot on my remote here we go when we look at cap rates, we go back to this equation, cap rates the denominator. So the smaller the denominator, the higher that value is going to be. And what we saw in the second half of 21 and the first half of 22 is that when cap rates went from about 4 to 3.5%, this is multifamily and warehouse, you saw about a 14% escalation in value. So commercial real estate value shot through the roof. And this was a good thing. But since cap rates are coming back up, that's going to bring values down just as fast as they went up. And that's dangerous because that reflects what we've seen in the back half of 22 and the first part of 23. So for those of you who are involved in commercial real estate, we're a little bit worried about cap rates. We do expect them to drive down values. For the rest of you who are not involved in commercial real estate, we're through the math. The rest of it's much more fun, I guarantee you. So, Switching over to uh, overview metrics for those sectors, I want to start with multifamily and show you some interesting things that we see on the residential front. So this is a chart that shows southeastern um, occupancy totals and rent growth figures for our markets. Occupancies are doing extremely well. They're between 93 and 97 percent in the southeast. We feel good about it. Rent growth looks awesome. The national number is about 7 percent. Uh, our top market in the southeast is um, Cape Coral at 16%, Savannah's at 
These are massive, huge increases in rent gains, unbelievable. But the problem there is that last year, these rent gains were at about 30 to 40%. So they're coming down really quickly. And if you go back to that value equation, net operating income is a factor and rent is a piece of that. So if rents are coming down, then that's gonna pull values down too. And the problem is, is that if we expect values to go down, then we also need to worry about supply. And we do see some supply issues ahead. So when we look at multifamily, we've got over 970,000 units under construction. That's an all time high. So let me ask you this. We are delivering the most multifamily units that we've ever delivered in history into an environment where rents are going down, cap rates are going up, and people are being pushed on their incomes as much as possible. That's a little bit scary. That's something that we really got to account for. And what we've seen just over the past few months is that we've had a little bit of negative net absorption in apartments. Now I say those things and it makes it sound like he's down on multifamily, but look at all this great green net absorption that we had over the past few years. There was so much appreciation from about 2021 through 22 that apartments have been fantastic properties and they're gonna to continue to do well. I feel good about them despite the oversupply and it goes back to this because mortgage rates are so high. It's very, very difficult to move from a multifamily or from an apartment complex and go buy a single family house right now. And let me show you some affordability statistics that are a little bit shocking. Over here on the left hand side, we've got starter home prices. Now, when I was coming out of college, a starter home was a thousand square foot patio home. It was cheap, you know, everybody got into that. Starter homes are different now. They have two to three bedrooms. They're already built for one to two kids. It's a more expensive product. And it's gone up significantly, as have all home prices, post COVID. So what we saw was in the second quarter of 2022, an average starter home price was $350,000. That's a big number. Now it's come down to 322 at the end of the year, but let's think about this. What's not great about that is that although that price came down, the monthly payment has gone up. So prices have come down about 9% and the mortgage payments gone up about 8%. That's not great. And what this is doing is it's forcing people to stay in apartments and not go purchase that first home. And it's not just a question of the affordability of the mortgage, it comes down to down payment. If you're looking at a $300,000 house and you've got to put 20% down, how many 21 through 30 year olds do you know at this point that can roll right in there with $60,000 cash and put it down and buy a house? They can't. They've all got student debt, they've got credit cards, they've got cars. You've all heard this before. So it's a real challenge. And as proof of that, I want to talk to you about a survey that we do. We do a lot of uh, work with our universities in the region. And at uh, Georgia, actually, last year, we surveyed students that were coming out of the school and we asked them, what are your housing plans when you leave the University of Georgia? Majority of them said they were going to leave and go to a multifamily project. But, um, you know, going back to the down payment question, what's amazing is we asked, if we had a question in there that says, who expects to buy a home coming out of college and can you afford an average down payment on a house? And we only had 15 people out of that entire University of Georgia survey that said that they could do that. And here they all are. <laughs> all 15 first round draft picks, including the punter, go dogs, my apologies to my Auburn friend here in the front row. All right. So when we look at multifamily in my group, we look at two things. The top part, don't really worry about that. We'll have, by the way, Kim will have this presentation available for distribution and we're, gonna, we're covering a lot. So feel, please go back and reference it. Call me at any time, I'm happy to walk through it. But one thing that we look up at the top, we look at jobs and apartment permits. And what we'll do is we'll take the number of jobs that are coming on a market and we'll divide it by the number of, apartment, of uh, permits. And if that number is five or above, we feel pretty good about it. And it was last year, 
But this year, we know that job growth is not going to be nearly as substantial as it was last year, and that has thrown things out of balance. That is actually made when we look at Atlanta, and I know nobody's really dying to look at Atlanta data, but this is real typical of what we see in most markets. If you look at the job to permit ratio in Atlanta, it's below one, and it says do not develop any more multifamily units in Atlanta. So why am I giving you Atlanta data when we're in Statesboro? You guys have a totally different issue. You know a lot of jobs are coming into this market, and you are bucking an economic trend that we're seeing across the country. So in my book, build the hell out of apartments in Statesboro because you're going to need them. It's going to be a great factor. So we feel really good about that. We'll switch over to office, and I think this is something that's given a lot of people concern for pretty good reason. Um, office occupancies in the southeast are dropping fairly significantly, but rent growth is still pretty good, and actually the top ones are Miami at 10%, and frankly, that's a bunch of people moving from New York City and going to Miami and relocating, and they're having to pay much higher rents. If you look at the bulk of the markets that we're in, you see rents from about 2 to 6%. Now, any of you who are commercial, real, uh, commercial realtors in the room will say that in a normal year, you kill for about a 6% rent increase. That's a great number. But let me tell you why it's a little bit problematic. If we go back to the value equation, so I lied a little bit more math, and we take a couple of assumptions. We assume 10% operating expense growth. I think that's fair in, a, in an environment where we've seen the inflation that we've seen, and a 50 basis point cap rate. If we back into the values to try to figure out what kind of rent growth do we need just to maintain property values, you got to have 7%. So the number of, seven, of, rent, of markets that we have with 7% rent growth in the southeast, two. And it's actually really one because they're both components of Miami. So this scares me about office. And it doesn't just scare me, it scares our investors. And for that reason, this is a slide that we put together when I go talk uh, with our CEO and CFO to um, our investor groups and analysts, and I cover the commercial real estate part of it. We point to our office portfolio and we show two things because all investors are worried about banks with a bunch of office on their portfolio. We have a good bit. Number one, we point to over 50% of our office product is medical in nature. If you know it, medical is totally different. We talked about how much money is flowing into the medical service sector. I have no worries whatsoever about medical office. We've shown that we're spending on that, and it's safe. So if our portfolio is over 50% medical, that's a plus. The second one, we go back and we look at all the collateral in our loan portfolio and office, and we say, how old is it? And we come up with an effective age. That's an appraiser term for basically taking into account renovations. How old is the building? Our properties are 2014 to 2015. That's really good, and I'm going to get into that why in just a second. But I want to go back to medical. Um, hate to use this bad pun that it is the healthiest office, but it's much more stable than other offices that we office types that we see. And I want to point out this line is a little bit difficult to see, but this navy line that you see bumping up and down, up and down, up and down. That's CBD office, and that's not the fun CBD. That's Central Business District office. It's extremely volatile because people can't decide whether or not CBD office is good. Think about it. You go back to before COVID, it was, well, all the baby boomers are moving back into the city because there's so many great things to do there. And then it was, well, yeah, but all the millennials need to move out of the city because they've got to go have kids out in the suburbs. And then it was, well, everybody's going to come back, but then COVID hit, everybody needs to leave again. They just can't make up their minds on whether that's good. So it's extremely volatile, and it makes it difficult from an investment perspective. But medical office, that gold line, continues to appreciate. It's worth more, and it tends to perform better over time. Now, I also referenced vintage, or age of our collateral, this is a great uh, slide that CBRE put out in the fourth quarter, and these light green lines show net absorption in office. And net absorption is just basically, you know, you put so many square feet on the market and you lease so many square feet at the same time. Whether that number's negative or positive obviously means that you've got more or less inventory available. And for the first time since COVID, we had negative net absorption. 
minus six million square feet in the U.S. Guess how many square feet of that negative net absorption was built after 2010? Not one square foot. New matters. People want to be in new buildings. They want new amenities. They want things like golf simulators and bars in their office. And we see this all the time, which is I kind of think who's getting work done if you've got a golf simulator and a bar in the office. But these things are there. They want new office stuff. So you're going to see more new office come with the development that's coming. So I feel really good about um, that for you guys. Now, I'm actually going to switch right into retail. Retail, a uh, little bit different deal. Retail uh, rent metrics are doing extremely well. We feel good about this. Um, occupancy rates look good. And I'm not really going to dig into too much on this. I will show you that rent collections from retail tenants are actually down. Um, we made a real good run after COVID where we got to levels that were above COVID. But over the past couple of months, we've seen less retail tenants pay their rent. And that's telling me that consumers aren't spending as much despite what you may say. And that makes people not pay the rent at the retail center. And you're seeing these numbers come down. Now, two months a trend does not make. But if we get another one, then I'm going to be a little bit worried about that. Once again, Statesboro is going to buck the trend. You've got more people coming. You're going to have higher wages, and that's going to result in more spending in different retail. And I'll get into that uh, at the end of the presentation. So logistics. This is another one that's obviously um, near and dear to your hearts because it's a good component of the, of the regional economy, specifically in the state. And this continues to do amazingly well. Rents are through the roof. Occupancy rates are fantastic. I mean, Savannah rents up 14% a year. Um, Savannah occupancy up 98%. Of course, anything that flows towards Atlanta, I think about all those distribution facilities around Dublin and some of the economic zones that have been created. You continue to see good demand there. And a big chunk of that takes us back to Peppa. Go over here to the left-hand side, and what we're seeing is a whole bunch more goods are coming into the East Coast and the West Coast. Now, you guys know that. A lot of people don't in other regions where I speak, but we're seeing a pretty good amount of container volume shift over to the East Coast because they don't want to go through the regulatory pressures that you see coming into California and the expense. Trick is, is that we know that imports are down. We think that exports are going to go down too. Recent export surge, really more of a result of supply chain uh, thawing. So we may see a little bit less volume. But to drill down a little bit more deeply into exactly how the East Coast is performing, that blue bar down at the bottom, that's the West percentage composition of um, cargo that's being shipped from Asia. So, you know, think about it. To get from Asia to the East Coast, that's some tough shipping. It's a, it's a lot easier to go across the Pacific. And it's a testament to just how difficult it is to do business on the West Coast. And when you look at the ports that are outperforming the most, it's Savannah and Charleston that lead the country. They're doing great. So that really, really bodes well for this region. Now, just to kind of wrap this up before we get into specifically how this affects Statesboro. Um, when I think about questions that I get all the time, first one is, are we in a recession? Well, unfortunately, this is, the answer really depends on your balance sheet. If you don't have a lot of money, you are feeling this. We are definitely in a recession. If you have a lot of money, then you're probably concerned, your biggest concern is the beach house rental went up 20%. People are still spending at the top end, but there's a whole lot of pressure down at the bottom end. So that's something that's going to be interesting to watch because that'll play out politically in the next election, and we'll see what transpires from that. Second one, how far will the Federal Reserve go? I think they're going to hold rates higher for longer. I do not think that this is going to be something that winds down quickly. I do think that given some of the bank volatility, they might not raise as much. But in my opinion, the Fed needs to kind of pause and let this ride for six months because they're basing this on data that lags and we really need to get a, a it's almost like everybody's running around going nuts. We need to just kind of stop and let the dust settle and see where we are before we move to the next one. I told you what I thought we'd see in commercial real estate valuations with cap rates going up a little bit and rents um, uh, tempering some. I don't think we're going to see big value losses at all, but you'll see a little bit 
depending on the sector. Apartments should stay strong, warehouse should stay strong. We'll see a little bit come down in office. But keep in mind, there's so much investment money that's out there waiting to go into these markets that it almost creates a safety net for the values of these properties. This is in 2008, where the banks default, you know, banks, is, banks are collapsing and properties are defaulting and people are throwing in the keys left and right. What's going to be different about now than then is that if you see a property foreclosed upon and it's going to be a distress sale, it probably didn't come from a bank because the regulators have, uh, have, uh, the regulators have been on us like white on rice. And I'm telling you, it's a whole different ball game for banks now than it was then. Where you'll see these properties fall out are in CMBS, so commercial mortgage-backed securities transactions, and non-bank transactions where they don't have the capital requirements and the regulatory issues that banks face. So that's going to limit the number of properties that are distressed, and you're going to see money come in and pay a level that's nowhere near the distressed prices in some instances that you saw in 08. In which sector will see the most impact in the short term, I think, Frankly, uh, I think it's going to be office, and, and I think apartments um, closely behind, just because we know that those rents are coming down fairly significantly, and we know that we've got some supply issues. But once again, mortgage rates are a big determinant of exactly how that fares. So, had to check those boxes. I want to get into the fun part right here and talk about Statesboro, specifically the GDP equation for Statesboro. Now, we talked about when we broke down third and fourth quarter how the, country, uh, Ill, how the country is distributed, but what matters for you guys is consumer spending and investment. We didn't have a lot of fixed investment in the third and fourth quarter in the U.S., but you guys are about to get a ton of it. It's happening. It's been happening, frankly. So in terms of how does the GDP look for Statesboro, that's a major component that will continue to get boosted up. And consumer spending will follow. I mean, you're going to have higher wages. You're going to have more people. You're going to have better shops. And it's going to be a great environment, and I know it because I've seen it. And you really need to look no further than LaGrange, Georgia. LaGrange is over there on my side of the state near Columbus, and they had a Kia plant come in in 2008. And I've actually, if you get this presentation, this Georgia trend underlined, this is a, an article published in 2008 where the people in LaGrange are talking about the first days of Kia's arrival. And it is dead on with everything that I heard this morning before I got on the stage. Getting a Korean liaison between the companies and the actual entities that you're operating. The suppliers that are supporting these industries. The things that you think are coming. It, it's amazing. Go back and read it because it really is, a, a, it's a forecast. It, it's a blueprint of what's coming. When I think about things that happen in LaGrange that I see happening here, they put in a new college that was really more oriented at tech and trade, and they put in a career academy, which they call Think. It's basically like a magnet school for tradesmen, and that's done remarkably well. It's one of the first in the state, and it has basically produced labor for uh, Kia over there, and that's going to be uh, more important. Greatly expanded multifamily and single family housing inventories over there. So, all the things that every other region is facing won't be nearly as acutely felt here in Statesboro. As a matter of fact, it's going to be more positive because you have to build more houses to house these workers and you have to build more apartments. This is coming. You're going to have more diverse retail tenants, you're going to see more of a national base, you're going to see things that come in. You know, uh, I think in LaGrange they had, um, I think it's called like the Lone Wolf Resort. It, it's a nice place that moved in. You had all kinds of brew pubs. LaGrange got kind of chic, which growing up 15 miles from LaGrange as a child just kind of blows my mind to say that. But it did. It's become really a fun place. And they've also done some neat stuff. They've got this thing called the Ray, which is an extension off of, um, 80, of Interstate 85. It's basically a uh, tech and community innovation exhibit. It's really neat what they've done. They've, they've gotten revenues into the market that's allowed them to do some fun, cool things that they normally wouldn't have done. All that's going to happen here. It's going to be great. But you got two major hurdles, and I'm going to take us back to Field of Dreams, and I, you know, I look here at jo uh, James Earl Jones here, and he's talking to Ray Canellis, and he says, if you build it, Ray, they will come. 
And the first one is labor. Now, where is it coming from? I heard a fantastic panel discussion that another bank put on a couple of months ago. I think the answer is we don't know, but they're coming. And I agree with that. They will come. I think especially in an environment where the Fed is putting active pressure to reduce employment, you're going to see people migrate to this market. So I do believe that they're going to come. I don't think that's as large of a hurdle as it may initially seem. But what I do think is a hurdle is if they do come to raise field, where are they going to park? And where are they going to go to the bathroom? And where are they going to get their concessions? And what I mean by that is sewer, infrastructure, grocery stores, those kinds of things. That's going to be the real challenge. And that's what LaGrange faces now. If you go to LaGrange, traffic is awful because the infrastructure was not built in parallel or before these things happened. So I'm not particularly familiar with the initiatives that are going on now to address those issues, but they're coming. And if you don't address infrastructure, then you're going to deal with the same problems. Now, they're not bad problems to have, frankly, because they're all problems that come with success and expansion. But those are the two things that I would point out. Labor, not that big of an issue. You're going to get it. Infrastructure, that matters. So uh, I'm sure people are working on that now, but that's definitely the one that I would address the most. So I'm going to wrap it up here. I appreciate you guys having me this morning. It's a pleasure to come to this market. Once again, always good to come to a place where they got a good story and celebrate that a little bit. Um, always good to come here and talk to my friends and partners here at Synovus um, in Statesboro. You know, going back to what I said on the front end of this, for us, it's all about partnerships. It's all about community development. That's exactly what we're doing this morning. That is the differentiator between banks like ours and the turbulence that you've seen in the market elsewhere. So thank you for having me. Um, I'll open it up for any questions. How much um, truth is it to that, the easing of bank regulations contribute to the bank failures out in California? I don't think that it had anything to do with regulations, frankly. Uh, if, you, if, if you're like me and you deal with the Federal Reserve all the time and you've seen the degree to which we're regulated, it's pretty intense. I think it's more of, an, a, 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 more of a failure of supervision, frankly. So everybody's following the rules, but if somebody's not checking to see how those rules uh, you know, are, are followed, that's an issue. Now, another thing is, in those particular cases, you know, think about the environment here. This happened because the Fed raised rates almost 500 basis points in the span of a year. And think about what was happening before that. Banks had so much money as a result of stimulus, they had to put it somewhere. The investors would riot if they didn't. And unfortunately, those banks put it in investments that were way too long range to protect themselves in the event of an emergency. And what we had was a shock. This shouldn't happen. We shouldn't have had COVID stimulus and the resulting fight on inflation. This is, it, it's, it's a crazy chain of events. Yes, sir. What percentage of the jobs that are open, the 10 million, I think was the number, are jobs that were vacated and not filled back versus new jobs created? Well, that's a great question, and I wish I could dial up my analyst right now to give you that. But I'll give you a little bit of color on that that's pretty interesting. When we look at, um, we do a commercial client survey that we send out, and if you haven't gotten one and you're one of our commercial clients, let us know so we can get you on the list. And we get narrative responses from these people to talk about, hey, what's going on in your, in your business? They come to me and I read them. And the thing that I see that's, that's interesting is that I'll get a lot of responses that say, I'm retiring. I'm shutting down my business. Don't survey me in six months. I'll be on the beach. Well, think about that. There are a lot of those groups around here. You've got people who are at, you know, they've got a company, they're at retirement age, and they shut it down. And if they don't transfer the company to somebody or sell it, then you lose jobs there. So some people have removed themselves from the job market, and that has caused others to lose their jobs as well. In terms of um, people not coming back, I think that one of the biggest challenges that we saw on the front end of it, and it's still working themselves out, working itself out, is um, daycare and generally women returning to the workforce because when you look at the skyrocketing cost of daycare, 
it's more economically feasible to stay at home and raise the kids than pay thirty to forty thousand dollars to have someone else handle your child when you're making the same amount at work. Why not stay at home and be with your children? Those kinds of things stack up and matter. Um, I'm more than happy if you'll catch me afterwards or email me. That's probably the best way to get me through the presentation. I'll get you the exact stats. But it's an interesting concept, and it's a real hard number to pin down. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.